Welcome to County Road 189, the haunted stretch of road that runs right through the middle of Bearheart Nation. I'm your host and co-pilot, Josh Bearheart Hawk, and today we're talking about alternate reality games, also known as ARGs or Unfiction, and uh, how this form of storytelling impacts us and uh, how we can take advantage of it. So buckle in, keep your eyes on the road, and look out for any ghostly hitchhikers. Okay, so I hope you're all having a wonderful day, week, whatever it happens to be whenever you're listening to this. Hopefully it's late at night because these tend to do really well late at night, especially if you're driving, enjoying some time out, or just trying to come up with that creepy, moody type of atmosphere. So whatever time you happen to be listening to this, I hope you're having a great time. So what is an alternate reality game? So you may have heard the term ARG, and it's it's kind of... I think it's confused from time to time with uh, AR as in uh, augmented reality, (laughs) as well as VR, virtual reality. And they're all completely separate things, although they could be combined technically if under the right circumstances. But an alternate reality game is really more of a uh, real world type of thing. It mixes a real world with real world with reality, and it's used to kind of tell a story. So the definition of ARG from Wikipedia, which I'm going with Wikipedia because there's a lot of different sources out there, they all kind of follow the same idea and the same premise. But Wikipedia is kind of a catch all. So <laughs> go with Wikipedia for a lot of this kind of stuff. So the definition from Wikipedia of an ARG. It says, alternate reality games are a modern genre of gaming, often consisting of an interactive networked narrative that uses the real world as a platform and employs transmedia storytelling to deliver a story that may be altered by players' ideas or actions. Most of these games are either independently run or used as a viral marketing campaign by a company or brand. So that's (laughs) a very broad and general definition, uh, but it kind of nails down exactly what an ARG is. So it's it's essentially the way it's supposed to work. Somebody has a story they want to tell, and the way that they tell that story is through a game that's put out in the real world, and the players of that game treat it as if it is reality because it's an alternate reality. Uh, Think of, if you ever heard of, (laughs) I don't want to say LARPing because... That seems like such an easy catch-all, but LARPing, live-action role-playing, what um, people used to do, uh, still do, I guess, D&D players and that kind of stuff, where they go out and they dress up and they they, they sword fight each other and that kind of stuff. Similar, but not really, because most of the time people aren't dressing up. They're just acting as if the world that they're interacting with is, is a real world. So a lot of these ARGs will create entire websites around whatever they're trying to <laughs> promote within the world of the ARG. There is one that I've, I have unfortunately never had the privilege of being involved with one that was ongoing, save for one last year that I was involved with. There was one for a few, I, and it worked really well because I'd never heard of uh, Harry Styles, who is a, a singer, apparently, I, I believe a European, a UK, United I, I don't know much about him. <laughs> I'm sure I've heard some of his songs. I'm sure he's fine. But he was releasing a new album. And there was this whole thing that was released. There was some like videos on YouTube, I think, that pointed to a website. And the website was for this like small fishing community, this this town that was like um uh trying to get people to come and visit a tourism website and that kind of thing. So it was all all the stuff that was built up and you didn't know it at first where it was coming from. Uh, the whole purpose of it was like you start digging in and you find you find puzzles, you solve clues, you get deeper into the into the whole. You immerse yourself in the world as you go deeper in, and so people were doing that, and I was excited because I was like, "Oh my god, this is the first time I've gotten in with one of these ARGs from the ground level, and I can really play along." So I started kind of playing along with it. The problem was when it came out that it was. Uh, there was first. It was a rumor that said it was for a Harry Styles album, 
And then it was all but confirmed by the record company that he goes through. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Because I thought this was going to be some kind of a cool storytelling thing. And in fact, it was a viral marketing campaign. <laughs> and companies use these because they're a fun way to get people in interacting. And they're a fun way to kind of get people excited about new releases. It's been used. They've been used for movies. They've been used for television shows. Lost had one back in the day. Uh, another famous example was 2001, the Spielberg film AI that had uh, hidden messages and a path to follow with them, like the, the poster for the movie and everything. One that was kind of not an ARG, but kind of an early predecessor ARG type was the Blair Witch Project, actually. <laughs> it was the one that really kicked off the idea that you could use these type of things as a, as a viral marketing campaign. Before viral marketing campaigns were a thing. This is back in the 90s. And the Blair Witch came out and it acted as if it was real. You know, I remember when it first came out or before it came out, when they were, when they were really pushing all this stuff, like, Oh, it's real found footage. We found this, these people were lost and we don't know what happened to them. And I, I fell for it. I was like 11, 12 years old. <laughs> and I see these things going and I'm like, that's so cool. You know, they found this video. These people really, you know, I would love to go check these woods out. You know, I was excited about it. And the people at school would be like, no, it's not real. It's not, it's just a movie. And I didn't believe them until after, of course, it came out. And then it was revealed that, yeah, this is just all made up. These are the actors. And because they had to let people know, because there were people that were legitimately concerned that the actors and the actresses or the actress and actors, there's only one actress, <laughs> but they were legitimately concerned. These people were like, not okay. And in fact, they were just fine. And they were out living their lives. So that really kicked off and showed what you can really do in terms of marketing using something like what would become an ARG later on. You know, with the Blair Witch Project, there was stuff to dig through on their website. There wasn't a lot of puzzles. You know, it was mostly just like Easter eggs and stuff. Nowadays, a lot of <laughs> big companies, when they want to go viral, they come out with one of these marketing campaigns and they put puzzles in there and get people involved and people dig in and and a lot of it, I think, goes into like the sunk cost fallacy because once you've invested so much time in something, you know, you spend a lot of time solving something, and then it comes back to you're going to say, of course, you know, yeah, this is the the most awesome thing ever because you've spent so much time doing it, and to admit otherwise would be saying that you had spent all of your time <laughs> on something that was really stupid. So it's really kind of a brilliant thing for companies to run with. Eh. Unfortunately, <laughs> in my opinion, I don't like it from a company standpoint. Um, ARGs, and, and like I mentioned in the open, they're also known as unfiction. Now, unfiction was a term that was coined in 2002 on a forum that was found specifically to track ARG and unfiction games. And it, it, they've tracked over the years different companies, different individuals. Typically, the the when a company does it, they're... Yeah, they're trying to tell a story, but usually that story is only in line with whatever they're trying to market. And sometimes it can be some really intricate and really well done stories, but they're doing it with the end goal of making money and they don't really care that much about quality. Yeah, they'll put a bunch of money into games and if you love puzzle solving, they can be a lot of fun. Some of them go over the top and just get so crazy with the puzzles. Uh, I, I follow... The subreddit <laughs> called it's called slash ARG or R slash ARG. And it is a subreddit dedicated to ARGs. The the thing with it is that a lot of these are you got people that are going in because they, they want to create an ARG. So they're they're hopping in and they're saying, Okay, I've got this brand new ARG, or my favorite thing, when they come on and they say, I want to make an ARG, but I don't really know what to do. <laughs> because they've become so popular. And especially among a very niche segment of people, they are extremely popular. And most of the time when people find them, it becomes a thing that you really want to just, you want to create something, you know, you want to, you want to be a part of this. You see what other people are doing and, and, and you're, it inspires you to want to do it yourself, but you don't have an idea. You don't know what you want to do with it. And I, I mean, I felt victim kind of, I've, 
loved the concept of ARGs for a long time. I have been following on YouTube. There's a couple of different channels that uh, like to break down these things and they'll go in and they'll read, they'll watch the videos. They'll dig into the puzzles. They'll go through the website. They'll follow the trail from the beginning to the most recent update, whether that's the end of the story or, you know, maybe they're partially along the story, wherever that happens to be. And one of them is uh, Nightmind. And there's a couple others that I follow that that I, I just love seeing the breakdown. You know, I, I'm not one of those people that loves to go in and solve the puzzles because I feel like I am competing against a bunch of other people with it. And to me, that's not as fun. I, I don't like to go in. If, I, if people have already solved a puzzle, I don't feel like going in and doing the same thing. You know, I just want to, see, I want to know the story. So I love listening to those channels that go through and break these things down to tell the story because to me, that's where it's, well, that's where it's fun. As a, as a writer, as an author, as a storyteller, I like to see where these stories come in within these ARGs in the worlds. So I've spent a lot of time watching those. And I, I thought to myself a couple of years ago, after I'd spent <laughs> a considerable amount of time learning about these things, I was like, you know, I really want to do one of these. And so I was trying to decide what exactly I wanted to do. And it was around about the time I started uh, really focusing on YouTube and everything. And I was doing the cemetery chats and I, I started coming up with the idea for the Reaper, which was the story that would eventually become the journal. But when it was the Reaper, <laughs> I had the episodes played up. I had the back, I had the stuff in the background, of the cemetery chats. You can go back still on my main YouTube channel and watch the bunch of different videos where you'll see like this guy appear in the background or he has an opening segment, that kind of stuff. It was all building up this story. And I was like, okay, I'm going to put all this in here and, and people will find it and they'll, and they'll want to solve the puzzle. And the problem was while I had a story, my execution was terrible and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what, you know, what direction to go with it. I was just kind of doing it to do it. So, <laughs> It fell apart rather quickly. You know, you'll still, you can watch some of my uh, older content and you can see stuff on there that it's like, well, that was really weird. Why did that happen? And it's all because I was trying to build into this ARG thing that just did not play up. <laughs> so I went for the last year and a half, two years in the back of my mind thinking like, I, I really want to do one of these. I really want to have some fun with this and, and create something that's a bigger story for people that like, like that like to puzzle solve, you know? And so a few weeks ago, <laughs> it was around the time, I think it was either, it was probably right before I went into the hospital because I had plenty of time to think about while I was there. Um, I thought of this idea for this pharmaceutical company called the Nautilus pharmaceuticals. And, uh, the concept was what I wanted to do initially was like do a video, write a whole thing up where I was like reading through an introductory to this company. Like if you were a new employee and that kind of changed over time to where I was like, Oh, you know what? Maybe I'll do this as an actual story and kind of play at it from that angle. So then I started writing the story, the Nautilus pharmaceuticals. And as I wrote it, I, I started getting this really long, <laughs> I, I like to keep my stories between like 1800 and 2100 words at most for the short horror stories. I was at 2800 words and I still wasn't done. And I was like, okay, this is going to be a little bit bigger. So I wound up making it two parts. So I've got the Nautilus Pharmaceuticals part one and part two. And I did it on two separate weeks, released the videos. Well, in between that, I started thinking to myself, there's more to this company that I'm laying out in these, in these stories. And I really want to share more of the story, but I don't want to do it in a way, you know, I've got GPS signal loss that comes out every Wednesday on YouTube, and that's already a long running story. I've got the short horror stories that release every Friday, and I don't really want to take up a spot with those and continue releasing stories. So what I decided to do instead was, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to come up with some short little things, uh, some short video teasers and to drop some more information. And then I'm going to put all that information and, and, and more, including a deeper 
understanding of the story and more about the Nautos for anybody that wants to go and dig it up. Now, at the at this point, we're about halfway through August, and I haven't fully launched it, but I've kind of already started putting stuff out. On YouTube, I have a video. <laughs> it's it's an advertisement for Thanatos Pharmaceuticals, uh, kind of an advertisement for like come and work for us type of thing. It's about a minute long, and <laughs> I, if you didn't know anybody, you might be like, oh, this looks like a, a legitimate company. And then I've got a short that came out with kind of a teaser of like something going on. And then, and then I've actually got on my website, a whole section dedicated to telling the rest of the story in different ways where people can unlock it. The overall goal and the overall idea here being that essentially, if you want to just listen to Thanatos Pharmaceuticals part one and part two, you get a great story. If you want to, Dive in a little bit with the ads, that, uh, the, the different videos I put out, you get a little bit more. And if you really want to dig into it, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of stuff. You can read through an employee log. You can, th th there's a bunch of stuff on it. It's all hidden behind some puzzles, some things that have to be unlocked. It's not anything complicated. It, it uses very simple stuff. Uh, my favorite, my favorite thing it uses is the Caesar cipher, uh, which is a pretty popular puzzle that a lot of people use, <laughs> and I think it's become. I, I think some people have gotten tired of seeing it. They've seen it so many times in the community, so they people have gone on and tried to develop and create more intricate and in depth. But I love the Caesar cipher because I like to keep it simple. My goal is that anybody at any level is going to get something out of it. If you just listen to the stories, you get the stories. If you go into the website and you, you use the Caesar cipher to get into the bigger stuff, you get a little bit more of the story. And if you really dig and you really go out, go all out, you're going to get a whole lot more. And you're going to find out details about this company that aren't easily available on the surface. And that's kind of the way I wanted to do it was reward people for digging in deeper and have some fun because I think that, you know, telling stories straight up is, is great, but telling stories in a way that I can then let people like find more information about them if they want to, it takes it up a whole nother notch, you know, and that's going to be the most dedicated people, the people that really, really love the stories and they really want to learn more. And that's kind of my goal, you know, over time. As a creative person, as somebody who writes, as somebody who does, <laughs> who's got a book out, who's got more books on the way, I, I'm, I'm trying to share my stories any way that I can. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to play the first two parts of the Thanatos pharmaceutical story. Um, this will be part one and part two that I put out on YouTube. And let you guys hear those. It's creepy. It's got a good atmosphere to it. I really like how they came out. They're probably some of my favorite stories to this point. So I'm going to play that and then we'll come back. We'll talk a little bit about the stories and we'll close out after that. So <laughs> I'm going to play them back to back with no interruption. So without further ado, here is the Nautilus Pharmaceuticals part one and part two. Welcome to the Nautilus Pharmaceuticals. The header on the packet read, I only interviewed with one person, and they made an offer to double my previous salary, so it only made sense to take the job. Two weeks after accepting the offer, I found myself in a little room where I had been asked to wait and look over the welcome packet as the hiring manager prepared the orientation presentation. I had never heard of the company before, even with 15 years of experience in the medical industry but they assured me that was due to the sensitive nature of their business and countless government contracts. The first page of the welcome packet contained a pretty standard letter from the CEO, thanking me for joining the team and promising my time with the company would be some of the best years of my life. There were a few pages with various facts about the Nautos and then some basic company policies that I would be asked to follow as an employee. There wasn't a whole lot that stuck out as anything to be concerned about, except for a brief paragraph under a section on working conditions. 
All employees are responsible for their own safety while on the lower levels of the facility. While we do employ armed guards for emergencies, they are not authorized to access floors B9 through B13 without prior consent of management. Please ensure you are following all posted rules and procedures when on these floors to ensure the safety of yourself and your fellow employees. What were they keeping on the lower floors that would be that dangerous? This wasn't the first place I'd worked with guards, but it seemed really odd to restrict them from entire floors of the building. That section aside, most of the rest of the packet was pretty standard. The Nautilus is a smoke-free facility, wear your ID badge at all times, stay in your assigned work area, all stuff I had seen in one way or another before. I had just finished browsing the packet when the HR manager came into the room. Hello James, I'm Vanessa. I'll be onboarding you today. Is there anything you need before we get started? Her smile couldn't have been any wider if she tried, and there was a glow about her that was almost off-putting. I think I'm ready. No one was able to tell me how long I should expect to be here today, though, and I was just wondering what time to let my ride know to pick me up. This shouldn't be more than three or four hours. With the facility tour, you should be done by 4 p.m., she replied as she sat in the chair across from me. Shall we get started? The bulk of the orientation was the same as every other company I had worked for over the years. We covered benefits, pay, setting up direct deposit, and filling out tax forms. Someone from IT came in around lunchtime to help me get my computer and make sure everything was set up properly. Any concerns I had over the lower levels melted away as the day progressed. The final part of onboarding was the facility tour. This consisted of showing me around the main areas of the building, including my workspace and what floors I would be working on. I was to be part of a team developing new drugs to help fight cancer, and I would mainly be working on the upper floors. As we climbed on the elevator and headed back down to the ground level so I could leave for the day, I noticed some odd symbols on the directory next to the buttons for the levels below B3. What's with the basement levels? Some kind of secret code? I asked. Vanessa turned to look at me, her smile less pronounced than it had been most of the day. The basement levels are off limits to most employees. They are reserved for top secret projects. Please just focus on the floors you are assigned to. Her eyes were almost hollow as she spoke. Not wanting to push the subject, I kept quiet for the remainder of the ride, thanking her for helping me to get onboarded. I left the building as quickly as I could and found my friend waiting for me in the parking lot. I was excited to finally get started the next day, but I couldn't get the thought about the lower levels out of my head. I had never worked for any organization that was so secretive about entire floors without providing some kind of information about them. Then there were the symbols on the elevator. They didn't look like any language I had seen. Were they some kind of code? Sleep didn't come easily that night. I tossed and turned as I wondered what my first full day would be like. It sounds silly, but I always have the same issue when starting a new job with a new company. The questions swirl in my mind about what my co-workers will be like, how I'll like the job. The addition of imagining what could be on the lower floors didn't help matters any. I eventually drifted off, catching at least a couple of hours of sleep before my alarm went off at 7 a.m. Begrudgingly, I climbed out of bed and got ready for the day before making my way downstairs and hailing a cab hoping the rain that was coming down in buckets wasn't going to be some kind of omen for how the day would go. Paying the driver as we pulled up to the door, I climbed out and ran the few feet through the downpour to the revolving door that marked the beginning of my day. I smiled at the receptionist as I shook the water from my hair and she gave a small wave as I showed my badge before going to the elevator, making my way up to the fifth floor. After successfully finding my desk, I realized no one else was in yet, so I decided to grab a cup of coffee from the break room while I waited for my team to arrive. With a caffeine-infused breakfast in hand, I logged into my computer and started going through some of the welcome emails that had arrived in my inbox overnight. I was so focused that I didn't hear the footsteps of one of my teammates walking up behind me. You must be James. Welcome to the team, he said, 
slapping my shoulder and causing me to nearly jump out of my chair. Oh, shit. Y yeah, <laughs> I'm James. Sorry, I was just checking my email. I didn't know whenever, when to expect everyone else to get here. I should be the one apologizing, he chuckled. I have a bad habit of sneaking up on people. Lee says I'm a ninja, but I think it's just the carpet in here that drowns out all the noise. I'm Chuck, by the way. Good to meet you, Chuck. And I'll keep that in mind. Maybe I'll sprinkle some chips on the floor or something so I can hear you coming in the future, I said, shaking his hand as we both laughed. The rest of the team trickled in over the following hour. I've never really been good with names, so as much as I tried to remember who was who, the only people I rarely remembered on that first day were Chuck the Ninja and Lee who turned out to be the team leader. It took a couple of weeks to get acclimated to the new role, but I learned the ins and outs pretty quickly and by the end of the third week I was going full steam on a couple of projects. I found myself so engrossed in the work that I soon forgot about the lower levels that had been so important the first couple of days in my mind. It would be about three months before I thought about them again, thanks to a shift in my job. <clears throat> James, come here for a second. Lee's eyes had bags under them, and his voice was more ragged than usual. I followed him into his office, and he shut the door behind us before taking a seat at his desk. I sat in the chair opposite him, my stomach turning in knots over what he could possibly want. Did I do something wrong? I asked. Something wrong? Oh, no, you've been outstanding. As a matter of fact, the company has asked me to offer you an advancement. This will be a new position on the team as we move forward with testing some of the drugs we've developed over the past few years. You'll be the liaison between us and... His voice trailed off, and I could tell he was trying to find the right phrasing. Certain departments on the lower levels, he finished. I leaned back in my chair, unable to breathe as he stared at me. The chance to find out what was on the lower levels was intriguing, but I wasn't sure I was ready for a new role. Why me? And why now? I asked. Honestly, your performance has been top-notch. You're the newest member of the team, and yet you've taken on more than any of the senior guys since day one. We've reached a place in our development that we need to start the testing phase so that we can get into clinical trials, and they told me to pick the best person we had to do the job. I don't know what to say. Thank you for the opportunity. Can I think it over? What exactly does this new position entail? Yeah, you can think it over, but I need an answer by tomorrow so we can get the ball rolling. You'll be working between our team and the testing teams on the lower levels. Basically, you'll oversee the tests and make sure everything goes all right, then report back so that we can tweak the formula as needed. I can't tell you what to expect down there, as I've never been down there myself. All I know is it's top secret, and you'll have some pretty strict protocols to follow. I thanked him and told him I would have an answer by the next day, before making my way out of the office and heading home. I knew I wanted to accept the position, but I also worried about whether I would be able to handle the task. After tossing and turning for a few hours, I finally came to a decision and drifted off to a dream about what I might find as I ventured into the belly of the beast in the coming weeks. The next few days consisted of a lot of new training material, signing a lot of paperwork related to keeping secrets and sharing a celebratory drink with my team. I found out I would be spending most of my time on level B5, though I may have to visit other levels as the testing progressed. I wasn't sure what to expect that first day I ventured into the basement, but if I had known what I was going to find, I wouldn't have taken the position. Level B5 was the initial testing phase. Historically, many medications meant for humans have been tested on mice and even dogs or primates, depending on the drug. I expected to find caged animals and people in white coats, but as the doors opened on the elevator, I was surprised to see a circular, almost prison-like room, with guards in the middle and thick metal doors lining the walls. Each door had a number on it, from 1 to 20, and the only sound to be heard was the whirring of computer fans and the occasional moan from one of the cell doors. As I stepped off the elevator, one of the guards turned and greeted me with a smile. Good morning, Mr. Allen. We're all set to begin testing in cell 1 whenever you're ready. Sorry, I wasn't really told what to expect down here. 
Are we testing on humans? I asked. The guard sighed. <sighs> they never tell you all what's up, do they? The subject we're testing on are technically humans, but they're the worst of the worst from society. They all owe a debt for one crime or another and volunteer to take part in these tests as a way to pay their balance, he said, a frown replacing the smile as he spoke. So they're criminals? I'm not sure this is ethical. My heart was trying to escape my chest as I processed what was going on. Like I said, they've all signed on voluntarily. Once the tests are over and their debt is clear, they're free to go, he said, a smile returning to his face. I really wasn't sure what to think at the moment. Human trials, even this early, weren't entirely unheard of, but it was really troubling that no one had mentioned this before I showed up for the first day. Resolving to get more clarity later on, I thanked the guard and told him I was ready to proceed. As cell one opened, I was greeted by the sight of a man strapped to a bed. His mouth held shut with a gag. Moving in and setting up my supplies on the table next to the bed, I began making notes on my clipboard about his current condition, taking information about him from the label attached to his shirt. He looked mostly healthy, considering his state at the time, but his label did mention that he was suffering from lung cancer. Once everything was recorded in my notes, I went about preparing the drug and injecting it into the IV that had been pre-placed in his right arm. I waited in the room for the required 30 minutes to watch for any immediate side effects and then retreated back to the main room with the guards. Okay, so he has to be monitored and checked for the next 24 hours. The drug should start to take effect in the next week and I'll be down to check on him daily. If anything happens, his vitals change or he becomes unresponsive or shows signs of some ne negative effect, call me immediately, I said. The guards acknowledged my request and I made my way back upstairs, intent on getting more answers from anyone I could find that might know about what was going on. The only person I could think to go to was Lee, but he'd already told me he was unaware of what was going on in the basement. I decided to try going to Lee's boss, who I'd never really met, but who I was sure would have some idea. Knocking on the door labeled Dr. Shrew, I heard some movement on the other side before a gruff voice beckoned me to enter. Opening the door slowly, I found the room to be rather dimly lit, with most of the light coming from a desk lamp of a man who looked to be in his mid-sixties, with gray hair and sunken eyes. Ah, Mr. Allen, I quite expected you would be finding your way up here this afternoon. You have questions. He lit a cigarette as he spoke. I have a few, yes. Nobody told me we'd be doing tests on humans. I'm not sure how comfortable I am with the setup. I assure you, there is nothing to worry about. Every person we bring in or take part in the tests of our drugs are willing to take the risks. Many have come before you, and all of them questioned it at first. It's only natural, given the weight our society places on human lives. I just have a hard time imagining they were truly able to consent being tested on if they were from prisons. Was it really a choice if they were seen as expendable in the first place? My face was starting to feel warm and my heart was racing again. Some of them are from prisons, yes. Most of those were serving life sentences or sitting on death row for unspeakable acts. We give them a second chance. When the testing is over, we set them free. He leaned into the light, revealing a scar on his left cheek as he smiled. Does every level of the basement contain the same thing? I asked. In a way... Everything we do here is for the betterment of mankind, Mr. Allen. The choice of whether you want to continue after today is yours, but I would ask that you give it at least a month. When you see the amazing things we are doing, you'll realize the bigger picture is much more important than a few prisoners.
My meeting with Dr. Shrew didn't go as expected at all. He provided some answers, but I left with even more questions. I knew he wanted me to give it some time, but I really wasn't sure I wanted to even go back. I didn't sleep at all that night, but I did decide to return the next day. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to what was going on down in the basement, and the only way to find out what was happening was to play along. I could take notes on what I saw, maybe find a way to gather some evidence, and get word of any wrongdoing to the proper authorities. That was the plan, anyway. The next day, I checked on my patient in cell 1 and found that he seemed to be doing fine. The stress I saw in his eyes the day before was replaced by a look of what appeared to be relief on seeing me again. I asked the guard if I could remove the man's gag, but I was told it was against protocol after another prisoner had bitten off the ear of an intern a few years prior. Adding to my previous notes on patient 1, I left the basement once more and returned to my desk. Several of my co-workers asked what the basement was like, but I wasn't able to tell them without risking my job and compromising my investigation. I didn't want to leave them completely hanging though, so I embellished what was down there and told them that the first trial seemed to be going well. Knowing I was going to need some form of respite, I stopped at a bar on the way home and helped myself to a few drinks. Not enough to get drunk, but enough that I could temporarily live with the lie I was telling myself. The cab driver that brought me home chuckled as I sang what I imagine was the greatest rendition of American Pie ever belted out in his vehicle, and he said he would be more than happy to give me a lift any time as I climbed out. I slept better that night than I had in years, but the morning was not kind. A couple of glasses of water and some greasy eggs and bacon helped stem the tide that was begging me to climb back in bed and I was off for another day in what I was now referring to as the dungeon. I started to get to know the guards as I spent more time down there. They seemed friendly enough, and they were more forthcoming than I expected when it came to information about the prisoners. I learned, for instance, that not all of them were prisoners that had been convicted of crimes. Some were vagrants taken off the street with the promise of a warm meal and some were suspected of various crimes against the country and were here in lieu of being sent to a government black site. My patient in cell 1 continued to improve over the week, finally being wheeled out on day 7 to find out if the drug had actually helped with his cancer. I didn't get to go with him for these tests, but I was handed the results a few days later that indicated there had been improvement and he had been set free. The improvement, though promising, wasn't as strong as expected according to the charts and scans, so my team got to work on improvements to the formula. Within days, a new drug was ready to go, and we were on to cell 2. This patient wasn't tied down like the first one, though he was still wearing a mask that prevented him from talking. His tag indicated that he also suffered from lung cancer, and he seemed eager to begin the trial. With the paperwork and injection complete on the second patient, I returned to my desk to follow my notes for the day and head out. Before I could leave, however, Lee motioned for me to join him in his office again. Dr. Shrew says you're adjusting well after a rough start. Yeah, I had some questions and objections early on, but I worked through them. I lied. That's good to hear. You're not the first person I've seen added to the basement but many of them didn't stick around long. I'm not sure what's down there, and I know you can't talk about it, but I'm here if you need anything. You're a great asset to the team, and I'd like to keep you around, he said, a smile growing on his face as he finished. Stopping at the bar on the way home again, I wanted to drink enough to erase the guilt of lying to Lee. He was an excellent boss, all things considered, and I wanted to avoid breaking his trust when possible. And that's more or less how the next few weeks went. Going to work, check on a patient until they were sent to be tested, and start over with a new one. I worked my way around the room, getting through eight cells before we finally received the results that we were looking for with the drug. 
It was a Monday morning when I was told I would be moving on to level B14 for the next stage of trials. There was a lot more involved in that stage, so I was told to be prepared to spend a lot more than a few minutes I had been spending with each patient on a daily basis. The training and paperwork was a lot more intense as well, taking me several days to complete before I could even get clearance to head down. Most of it was pretty standard non-disclosure type stuff, and there were a lot of new emergency procedures related to the depth I would be at below the building. Not all of the procedures were about the structure of the building, though. An entire section was dedicated to what should be done in the event of a patient biting or scratching you. The threat from the patients was apparently so great that I was being given a stun gun, with a couple of hours dedicated to training me how to use it, in addition to the armed guards that would be present at all times. This all seemed ludicrous to me, but I went along with it out of a sheer sense of curiosity. The first day of traveling down to the dungeon finally arrived, and I made my way into the elevator. Part of the new orientation for B-14 involved some training on the weird markings that labeled the lower floors. Apparently, they were a quick reference for the computer scanners, one of which I now had, that controlled access to the floors. If you had the appropriate clearance, the scanner would act as a key to allow you to get to the right floor as well as providing security reminders and tracking your location when on the floor. This last thing bothered me when I first read it, but as the doors opened to reveal the new level, it all started to make sense. The first thing I noticed was that the guard position was off to the left of a rectangular room. Camera monitors lined the wall behind the desk, and a heavily armored guard sat at the computer terminal facing the elevator. A long corridor stretched into the distance directly across from the elevator, with the side halls branching off every 20 feet or so. As I stepped onto the floor, another guard appeared from a doorway to my right, wearing the armor and carrying a gun that looked much too powerful for where he was. Greetings, Mr. Allen. Before we begin, I just need to run a quick scan to make sure you don't have anything that can be used as a weapon, he said, pulling a small device out of his pocket. Remembering the part of training pertaining to not bringing anything that could be used by a patient to harm others into the cells, I held my arms up and waited for the scan to be complete. Alright, you're clear. Please follow me. We moved down the hall at a brisk pace, walking much further than I expected. I could hear the occasional moan from various rooms along the branching hallways, but our footsteps were the loudest sound otherwise. After a few minutes in the main hallway, we took a right onto one of the branches and continued for another couple of minutes before taking a left and stopping at a door about halfway down the hall. Room 15-93, patient ID 88392. Proceed with caution. You are allotted three hours, the guard said in an almost robotic tone. I knocked lightly and made my way into the room, unsure of what to expect but bracing for the worst. There was no way I could have prepared for what I found. The room was decorated like a nursery with pastel colors and bright lights. There was a crib against the wall to my right and a soft-looking blanket and several stuffed animals strewn about its interior. The floor was carpeted, covered in a mess of green shag. A TV recessed into the wall behind thick glass was playing a kid's show, with the volume turned all the way down and the captions flashing as the character spoke. It took me a minute or so to notice the figure sitting in a chair in the corner of the room. As I found my bearings, I realized the figure was a woman who was strapped into a rocking chair. Her arms are latched, though free enough that she had a small range of motion available, which she was taking advantage of to hold what I thought at first was a baby. As I moved closer, however, I realized it was just a doll. My mind was racing at that point, and my stomach made an effort to make me leave. The half-smile on the woman's face as she stared blankly at the television didn't help me feel any better, but I knew I needed to stick with it. 
I was told in training to avoid contact with patients on this level and to never speak while in the rooms. I wondered how it was going to be possible to do my job without talking or being able to get close to the patients, but it turned out that worry wasn't necessary. An IV was already in the patient's arm, with the injection port safely off to the side and several feet away. Monitors for heart rate and blood pressure were set up and keeping track of the vital signs, so all I really had to do was write down the information that was displayed on the readout and inject the drug. Once that was complete, I settled into a chair across the room to spend the next couple of hours monitoring the patient and recording their vitals every 15 minutes. I nearly dozed off more than once as I waited for the minutes to pass, but the time to leave finally came and I hurried back into the hallway to find the guard still waiting next to the door. After walking back to the guard desk in silence, I thanked the guards and told them I would be back the next day and asked them to call me if anything happened before then. I spent the rest of the day at my desk filling out the mandatory report to detail everything I did while in the basement and avoiding talking to my co-workers who were full of questions. As soon as I was finished with the paperwork, I slipped out the door and returned to what had become my nightly routine. Cab ride to the bar, drinks, stumble out to another cab, home, bed, my imagination was running away with what I saw that first day. Who was that woman? Why was she there? The file had indicated she had terminal lung cancer and not much time, but how many more like her were on that floor? I arrived the next morning on B-14 to find out the woman had been cleared overnight as cured and released. That's not possible. Why didn't anyone call me? I asked as the guard handed me a new patient file. We were instructed to inform you when you arrived today. If you'll please follow me, I'll escort you to the new room. The guard responded. I might have been in shock at the whole thing. I'm not really sure. There isn't a drug in the world that can cure any disease that fast. I didn't even pay attention to the path we were taking as we wound deeper into the facility, finally winding up at room 15-2962, patient 363949. This room was decorated like an office, with walls painted to look like bookshelves and a large flat screen TV encased in the wall displaying an outdoor scene as if it were a window to the outside world. The patient was also strapped into a chair but he was staring at me and grinning as I went about my work. It appeared that none of the patients on this level were going to have mouth coverings, making me appreciate the fact that I didn't need to get close. I assumed it would be another boring three hours as I monitored his vitals, but I wasn't that lucky. Hey there, Doc, he said, speaking for the first time after just the 15 minute mark kept my eyes on the paperwork, desperate to pretend I wasn't there. No, 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 don't speak. I was just curious about when I might get out of here. They promised me I would be leaving soon, and I'm just dying to get out, he said, emphasizing the word dying as his smile somehow widened. He didn't speak again over the remaining couple of hours, but my nerves were ready to crack when the time ended. I rushed back into the hallway, closing the door a little too hard behind me. Just before the door latched, he got one more line in. See you tomorrow. Oh wait, no I won't. I was shaking as I followed the guard back to the elevator. I couldn't come back. Whatever was going on, I didn't want to be a part of it anymore. As soon as I got back upstairs, I went to see Dr. Shrew. I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore, I said, as I sat down across from him. Well, you aren't the first to get cold feet. Did something happen? The patient's on B-14. My nerves just can't take it, I said, taking the cigarette from his outstretched hand. That floor can be a hard one for sure, but you've helped so many people already. 
There's only a few weeks left on this phase. Can't you just hold out a little longer? He said as he leaned back and lit his own cigarette. I really can't. How did the first patient get cured so quick? And what do they know? The guy I saw today said he wouldn't be there tomorrow. Did he now? Well, that's good to know. They aren't supposed to speak. The woman you treated yesterday was healed. The drug you gave her killed the cancer and she left this morning. She just had a baby, you see, when she found out she was terminal. We gave her a new chance. You gave her a new chance, he said. Can I go visit her? Maybe I could handle staying if I just had the chance to talk to someone who had been cured. <sighs> I knew this day would be coming, though I had hoped it would take a bit longer to get here. I'm afraid you can't visit her. I accept your resignation. Please clean out your desk, and security will escort you from the premises, he said, turning in his chair to face the window behind him. Standing up, my head was spinning. The conversation had ended much more abruptly than I expected, and my legs felt like they were going to give out at any minute, as I left the office and made my way back to my desk. I had just finished gathering my things when a security guard showed up to lead me out. My entire team was watching, all of them looking at me like I'd done something horrible. Even Lee was scowling as I passed his office, glancing at me only briefly. The guard hit the button on the elevator and the doors closed. As we started to move down, I glanced over at the panel and noticed that the button for the ground floor wasn't lit as it should have been. Instead, B-11 was highlighted. My heart started racing and my stomach turned. Had the guard hit the wrong button? Why were we going to that floor? I didn't have a lot of time to plan, but as the elevator came to a stop, I knew what I needed to do. As the doors opened, I scanned the floor in front of me as quick as I could and bolted from the car without a word, moving toward a hallway on my left. I could hear the guard yelling, but he didn't give chase. The hallways seemed never-ending. Some were well-lit and others were dark and foreboding. I ran for several minutes before finally stopping to catch my breath and look around. The first thing I noticed was a lack of doors. The walls were all painted fuchsia, or a shade close to it. When I felt sure the guard hadn't followed me, I started to walk around, looking for a way out. I have no idea how much time passed. It must have been hours before I realized this maze was much bigger than I could have anticipated. I ran into so many dead ends that I lost track of them. I was on the verge of giving up when I spotted a door that led to this room. The only thing in here was a stock of paper and pens, so I figured the best use of my time right now would be to write down everything in the hopes that someone will find and expose the Nautos for what it really is. I'm going to try and map out this labyrinth, but I don't have a lot of faith in my ability to get out. I've been seeing shadows and hearing whispers down here. I don't know what B-11 has in store for me, but I'll keep pushing on until the bitter end, no matter what's out there. Okay, so like I said, <laughs> part one and part two, complete story right there. With some exception, at least some stuff at the end there to kind of question, like, what is going on? What happened to this guy? But I wanted to, you, you could walk away from that, like any of my other stories, and say, wow, at the end, like, and, and speculate. What, what What's going on with the guy? Where's he at? Did he get out? Did he escape? Is he still there? But at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's it falls right in line with every other story. The deeper stuff <laughs> comes from the YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff. So, and, and I don't want to spoil any of it. You know, maybe at some point down the road when the story is complete and I feel like a lot, you know, I feel like everybody who wants to go through it has gone through it. Maybe I'll go through it and kind of unravel the whole mystery and, and answer questions because I'm sure even after going through the whole thing, people will have some questions. So that's something that I'm planning on doing. Outside of that, 
<laughs> I don't realistically like we're getting into the fall now. We're getting into uh, if you follow me on YouTube, you know that I've got a couple of different YouTube channels. I've got the main channel, which is where I share the stories and that kind of stuff. I've been streaming on there recently. So last few weeks, I've been kind of getting into streaming, live streaming, playing games, talking, chatting, reading part of the journal for people. Like, so I've been doing all of that. And then I've also been focused recently on obviously this podcast, but also <laughs> as I spoke of in the last one, I've got the cemetery chats that I'm planning on bringing back this fall. And my wife and I are going to be going out and filming a few of those here in the next few days so that we can get them kind of set up and released. And we're going to have some fun with it. The first the first one at, at this point is planned to be about aliens, <laughs> given some recent news events. So if, if that's something that sounds cool to you, you can always go over. Uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, it's, it's simple enough. Go to the main channel page. Go to, go to my I've got a, a channels link, so you can find the Cemetery Chat channel fairly easily. If you're listening to this on any other podcast platform, first of all, hey, how's it going out there? <laughs> Leave a rating. That would be great. But outside of that, uh, you can go to youtube.com slash Josh Bearheart and find all that information as well. So I've got that going on. <laughs> it's been it's been a busy few weeks for me. Uh, getting back into all of this and trying to figure out what's next, especially because like at the beginning of September is when I find out what happens with this uh, contest that I've entered for with the journal. I've got October 1st right now is the plan. And that I don't see any reason why this wouldn't happen, but <laughs> the planned release date of my next book. And that is going to be a compilation of all of the horror stories that I've released so far on YouTube, as well as a few others. I actually went in and I, I was, I, I set all the stories up and I was like, okay, I've got it divided as monsters, ghosts, and then legends, which are things based on real like true legends or true history. And I realized out of all of those, I had 18 stories, but only two of them were legends. <laughs> the, I think it was like 11 that, or yeah, it might've been like 11 that fell under monsters and like five that fell under five or six that were ghosts. So I was like, okay, we need some new stuff going on here. <laughs> so what I'm doing is at the in, in the legends section, there's going to be four or five legends, I think five at this point, that I'm going to be adding in there that I'm not making YouTube videos of. And they're going to be exclusive to the book. The only place you're going to be able to find them is in the book. So that's a big thing that I've got coming out. I'm, I'm probably going to add a couple other stories that are exclusive to the book. And then I've got all of my flash horror stories in there as well. And the book itself is going to be called Legends and Tales, uh, stories to be told around the campfire. And the idea of it coming out in October, you know, it's just in time for Halloween. You can get it. You can have, if you have, you know, campfire or something out behind your house or you go camping in October, whatever it happens to be, it's the perfect time for spooky stories. So I'm releasing it just in time for Halloween and the spooky season and all that kind of stuff. And with the hopes that, uh, you know, maybe we'll build some excitement about it. <laughs> That's the ultimate goal is to get the excitement built. I'll be talking more about that in future podcasts. Uh, especially coming up in the next few weeks. But until then, I think that's all I've got for today. Um, I do want to thank you all for listening. If you're on YouTube, I want to thank you all for watching. You all are amazing, and I love each and every one of you. Everybody have a great rest of your day, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>